standard protocol. Let me see if it's this way. Okay, here we go. Really centered. Let's start with our standard protocol. 30 seconds of quiet time. And then I'll start it with, uh, with our prayer. Let's start now. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray for your blessing on this time that we're together in your word. Help us to understand these great principles that you have for us, these commands, these entreaties, um, as they are to keep us safe and to help us understand these great principles. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so we are on verse 2. We kind of started it, but didn't make much progress. <clears throat> Anyways, June 16th, 2024, Sunday, Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Uh, but I think for us, rather than commercializing it, it is to remember that, that uh, our Father is responsible, uh, responsible for all the sweet and perfect blessings that we have. <clears throat> and we always have Him, and the truth is we know it's every day, right? Just like it is with World Father's Day and Mother's Day. Um, today we'll be doing two and three. We left off right over in here, this principle. But I want, you know, I was looking at this and I was thinking that I'm not sure everybody actually follows the structure of, of what I put up here. So I'm just going to take a second to uh, talk about it. Um, you know, we have a verse up here. Um, I thought one of the interesting things is that <clears throat> nobody's ever asked why these verses don't all kind of go together. I mean, why don't I have Romans the 3.25 here and then this just follow that and that follow that and and have them all put together. Well, one of the reasons for that in reality is they're actually all by um, they're not the same. Um, they're not related to the same part of the verse we're studying. What I mean by that, if you look at this verse here, and we'll just kind of this is true. This is true in every class we have. Okay, so if you're ever wondering, this is why it's important to read the verses because it reinforces a different part of the verse itself. <clears throat> so like in the first part we have, uh, and walk in the way of love. This is actually one thought. This is actually one principle. In fact, we know it's a command. And then it says, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. That's another thought. Okay? And this is telling, telling us both the example that Christ is with respect to um, walking in love, divine love, that's why he's our example. And this is talking about the human love that Christ has as he's filled with the Holy Spirit and is the perfect man, God's man. <clears throat> so it's related like that, obviously. It says, and gave himself up for us. We remember this doesn't, this isn't really up. Uh, it's not gave. Um, gave is the word didomy. The word behind here is paradidomy. It means to deliver himself up. Okay, so that's a whole different concept uh, in, in reality that he made that decision. It also reinforces our understanding of the scripture where um, that um, even though the Father put him on the cross, and even though the Jews and the Romans put Jesus on the cross, in reality it is Christ himself who delivered himself up. He willingly went. Um, it tells us that, in reality, even though they indeed murdered him, they could not have without his permission. Not without actually, in their evil, cooperating with the Father's plan. Even though they did it for evil, God did it for good. Because we're saved, right? That's the basis of it. So it kind of helps us in that part, too. It reinforces another doctrine we know. So we have the second kind of principle doctrine up here. And then as... Uh, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is actually a, a kind of a different concept. In reality, it actually draws on the concept of the sacrificial um, offerings um, in the temple, in the Jewish temple. And we know that because it uses identical words. And these, these words underneath here, uh, prosphora, is the word under here, is actually talking about an offering. We'll get it. It's actually to kill something and to offer it. Okay, it has that connotation, as does uh, um, thrumia in the word sacrifice. It's directly related to the Levitical offerings uh, there. So, it, it, to God, this actually is a different principle. And the way we saw it, I added this verse, by the way. Uh, this is an excellent verse 
on this verse. It's not a parallel to it, but it's very explanatory. It actually kind of relates us directly to the Levitical offerings of which Christ was. So we have the, these verses here as they're laid out. In reality, uh, this verse here has to do with this one. This verse has to do with that one. And so that's why they're laid out that way. Um, the verses I pick are usually the ones that I think are the uh, parallels, and they're really more designed, the ones I pick uh, to give in the class. I pick those actually to, <clears throat> to have a second reinforcement of some of the principles. Sometimes they just have this principle in them, the verse, and other times they have this one in them. I mean, we know that if I use the one to walk in the way, uh, I mean, I'd have ten verses just for that one, because there's a lot of uh, uh, using the word peripateto to walk, which actually doesn't mean the word, it does mean to walk, but it means to live in a manner of, is really what it means, and we know that. Um, and this one here, like this one actually hasn't got anything to do with these two, it actually has to do completely with this one, although we understand that. So if you look at the principle there, what that really does is it, let, it really laces together um, one verse with multitude of doctrines to it and actually flushes it all out in all, different, all of its directions, in this direction, this direction, and in this direction, all separately. In fact, I, I was thinking about it, and I'll do a little bit more we present today. I could actually label this like uh, point one, point two, and then point three, and as these verses, color code them and circle them so that you know which one of them goes where. So, the, when, I, when I encourage you to, to read them, it it's really uh, helps you to flush out every piece of, those, of the verses that are presented here to multiply confirm what these verses say. In fact, many times, and we'll run into more than a few of them today, where the exact same word is used, exactly. Not just the, not just the root word, but used in the exact context. And uh, what that's done for is it tells us that this verse is supported uh, and the way that we're kind of dissecting it is exacting, means that it is a principle. These are the principles that we're supposed to learn. Okay, this is the doctrine. When it says, be transformed by the renewing of, 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 the, uh, of the word, this, in, these doctrines are the renewing part. Uh, and, and the principle of that particular verse, uh, Romans 12, 2, tells us that it is the verse itself, by inculcating them, it's kind of, ro kind of like rolling it, um, I'd say rolling it over in your mind, but I always think of it more like water flowing over your mentality of your soul. Uh, as, as, these, as these flow over it, and you accept them because you know that they're true, it is the power of the Holy Spirit that uses these verses and these principles to change you passively. Okay, it means that you don't do it by self, by saying, okay, you know, I'm going to do this one today, and I'm going to do this one today, which is a lot of Christians do that. They memorize a verse, I'm going to get this verse down really good, and I'm just going to do, do, do. Uh, the scriptures tell us very clearly in Romans 12, too, that's not how you change. That's not the process by where the Holy Spirit changes you. We'd like to think that we have the ability to just kind of indoctrinate ourselves, but that's not how the change takes place. What it's really telling us in those verses is that when we use this process that God has provided for us as a way to um, get closer to Him and to allow Him to make us, like I was talking about last week, to make us into this soft clay that He wants to mold us into, like the scripture says, Paul says, these vessels of honor, these Christ-like uh, mimics. That's the word we ran into, last uh, verse 1. This is, the, this is the process that God does it. He doesn't do from you swearing you're never going to do it again, or that you swearing you're going to do it again. The process is a slow one, very similar to if you've ever had rocks before, is, is, is that when the way you take a, make a rock smooth, is by putting it in the ocean and watching that wave just push over it and push over it and push over it. That's what happens. It's the Word of God that does that to our soul that creates that beautiful, marvelous, round, rock-like thing. And in our case, it is to make us more like our Savior. It is to make us more Christ-like. And that makes it permanent. 
Okay, so that, that's kind of the process that we see up here of what it's talking about. And, and that's why I lay it out like this. That's why, uh, you know, you, uh, I, I would ask, can't you put the verses in order? You know, can't you put them in order? They're not meant to be in order. This verse here, this John here, with the first John stuck in between, actually follows as we're going through the verse. So it, um, it, it, it supports different parts of the theology and the doctrines inside the verse itself. There are many, many doctrines in this verse, okay, that we could examine. So, if, if, um, if you look at it that way, this is one of the reasons that, you know, my opinion is that when I study this, um, I look at every single one of these verses and I actually put my notes in it. And what it does, if you notice the way it goes together, in fact, you'll, hopefully if you're looking at it today, you'll see that it also interrelates the doctrine that's up here with other doctrines in the other verse. So it's kind of like you, you have this, this, this uh, edifice, you have this, this piece of the verse itself, and what you're doing is you're kind of smoothing a piece onto it. You not only confirm the doctrine that you have, but sometimes you, what you do is you, you put another piece of that doctrine that interrelates to something else. And what you have is you have this big collage that is reinforced together in scriptures. That's how a Bible study is supposed to be done. That's why we do it this way. That's why it takes us 50 minutes to get through two verses. In reality, we cover many of the verses and many of the doctrines. But that's why it's to be done. And even though um, many people don't understand that and don't even like it, that's the way in which that, that water rolls over your soul and reinforces it. That's why it's important that you know it, that you get it, that you don't just hear it and let it just wash away uh, the, by, by the afternoon. Um, you actually listen to this and you, and you kind of uh, preserve it in, in, the, in the mentality of your soul. Um, hopefully that makes sense. It was meant to make sense, but that's, that's what this does. Every single verse that we put up here has this quality to it. Okay, and then sometimes we'll we'll branch out like in verse three. We're going to branch out of it where there is actually a concept in here. There's many concepts in here, but we're going to branch out of it and show you that um, one the way he wrote this thing actually isn't what it's supposed to say. Okay, and and, and it's not that what he translated is incorrectly. It just has the, the the way in which this first verse, like this first word right here, is. Is translated tells us that he didn't translate this one and this one to match this one because they look like three different subjects. In reality, they're all intimately related, and they actually tell us something about this, about the problem that the Ephesians had, very extremely common in the churches, which you see you run into with Corinthians all the time. And we'll talk about that, but it helps us understand these things. Some of these things we don't have as examples, and maybe it doesn't even apply to you. You know, you don't have a problem with sexual immorality, but what you will find is that it's not alone. This this principle. And this concept are, are written in other verses where it does not have the context of sexuality because Christian problems, uh, many, many Christians have sexual issues, okay? Uh, morality and uh, even uh, perversion in reality. And I'm not talking about the Catholic Church and the little boys. That was a joke, sorry. But it's true too, too. In reality, when you look at this, you will see this, you will see this part right here well, this word right here is talking exactly about that, about that same issue. Um, yet, the, the, whoever it was who, who uh, redid this was too uh, pious to write out what it really said in its true context, even though um, this class doesn't get that benefit of that purity. You get the benefit of the actual word. So, it's got to move on, but, that, but that's kind of how it's designed so that it gives you a depth. And if you are doing reviews on it, what you need, want to do is you, you actually want to review the verses in it. And you will see that they do exactly that, that they are not only reinforce uh, stuff we're not in the class, we're not doing in the class, but they add doctrines to it that are true and attached to it. So, verse 2. To walk in a way of love. 
And, and well, I'll just talk, talk about this is the word peripatetto, and it doesn't mean the walk. The word peripatetto means the walk, but that's obviously what he's not doing here. He's using it as a metaphor. And that metaphor uh, is a manner of life. So he's telling us, live a manner of life uh, that is the way of love. That, that way of love is talking about uh, divine love. It's the word agape. Uh, and this tells us that um, this way of life is not a human love, which too often Christians somehow think that their, um, their meager personal love has the ability to change everyone, because it's, it's, it's talking about a manner of life, okay? Uh, that, that's an absurdity, uh, and it's an absurdity because if you try to personally love people, one thing, people are personally lovable, if you understand personal. Uh, they're not. Uh, some people are, your wife, your kids, you know, maybe dear friends, but many, many people do not qualify, certainly not Christians. Uh, and I mean that, that when you really get to know Christians, sometimes they have big struggles. And they're not likable people sometimes. Sometimes they're um, legalistic, they're judgmental, they have all these other things, like people do, have. So this is talking about an impersonal love that is included in the word agape, like God so loved the world, even though that's kind of a metaphor. Uh, actually, it's an anthropopathism, but uh, this tells us this is a divine love. This is a love that you as a person are not capable of producing on your own. Only God can produce this, okay, in you. This is why we tell us this. And it gives us a comparison that not just a love, but a love like Christ, like the perfect man. How do you do that exactly? Okay, and then not only that, but he says, and gave himself up for us. So I want to see you live a perfect life and put yourself on the cross for the world. That, that's, a, that's a divine love that we're not capable of doing in reality. We're just not, well, we're not perfect, so our sacrifice would mean very little. But you see people trying to do these things not understanding the rest of the doctrine that goes with them, that kind of uh, embraces it and gives it its very specific meaning that God the Holy Spirit and Christ himself in scriptures meant them to be to us, to allow us to understand what he's asking of us. So what happens is, is that the church so often does what it thinks is nice and sweet and kind. Oh, she's the nicest lady, she's just... Ah, so Christ-like. Oh, she just might be a nice lady. And maybe that's the only part you see. I don't know. But you know what it's not, most likely? It's not the love of God. Because that's a different love. That's a love that passes all understanding. It's a part that tolerates people sometimes when they shouldn't be tolerated. So getting to where we're at in this thing, I was thinking about another thing here that's interesting. Don't want to use all my time up, right? Is that very, very often... Christians use the Ten Commandments as the structure of how they should live their lives. You know, I obey the law, although we know that they're liars, but because they don't go to church on sun Saturday, which is the Sabbath, not the Lord's Day, which is on Sunday. <clears throat> but they, they, they live by the Ten Commandments, yet you never see anybody take these commands that are New Testament and are specifically the Christians. I mean, the last two verses of chapter 4 and the next, what, 12 verses will all give us very specific commands, both how to and how not to walk as Christ. I've never heard anybody bring these up. Say, oh yeah, you know some of the ones we follow? You follow, uh, you follow uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, through chapter 5, verse 12. That's how we should live our lives. There's command after command after command. We've gone through four of them already. But you never hear anybody say that. These are specific to us as Christians. These are the ones. It tells us to love as Christ loved. And how did Christ love? Most of us can't fathom through that either. We can look at what he did, but his love was a divine love that came out of the filling of the Holy Spirit that we know the scripture tells us that it flowed out of him without measure. The Holy Spirit did. And that love of God, that is the fruit of the Spirit, was one of those aspects of it.
Okay? Many times you'll see this in other things. Uh, the way of, and it'll give you another piece of that fruit of the Spirit as a piece, because that's the part it's looking at in the verse. Okay? So, um, let's, get, let's get into this thing. First, this is the fourth command we've had. Um, and this is walking in the sphere of the love, divine love of God. And that is the spiritual life. You only get that by walking in the Holy Spirit. It is a system that is unique to Christianity, is unique to our time. It's not something, this is a perfect example, you can't take this and put it back in the age of Israel and tell, you know something, we all, we, we all walk the same, Christianity, Old Testament, New Testament, Church, New Testament, Old Testament. It, it, that's not true. And how do we know this? Because it asks us to do something that is very specific to Christ himself. The Old Testament people didn't know Christ. They didn't know the man Christ. They didn't know Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Okay? What they did know is very little about him as the Savior would come, and they knew that stuff. But they didn't have the ability to walk in that life. They didn't have the filling of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So this is very unique to Christianity, which is why it should be our purpose. And if you remember me telling you that the verb here, the peripeteo verb, is not only a command uh, for us to do it. So he's giving us commands. He's just command, command, command. You know, mimic Christ. Um, it, it just gives us the command over and over again. Um, this one here is also the, uh, the piece that's the aorist part of it, this piece of grammar, is called repeated action. It's, uh, it's called iterative, an iterative aorist. We know that that's what it is because we can see it. Um, but it means to repeat something over and over and over again. Okay? The uh, active part tells us that we do it as a continuous action. This is, this is part of the requirement. It's not do it here, do it there, do it here. It means that you do it your whole life. Okay, You do it your whole life. Just as Jesus, as a man, did it his whole life. Okay, And this is a command to us as believers. The important part of this is like we talked about last week. This is a significant requirement of spiritual maturity because it makes your maturity effective. Maximum effectiveness of Christianity is knowing all that God has to say for, to us, the doctrines, and walking in the Holy Spirit, and therefore making it extremely effective in spiritual maturity. There's no problem with that, but Christianity doesn't think that spiritual maturity is actually something that they should be doing. They just think they should be a be a good mom, be a good dad, be a good worker, be a sweet person, go to church every Sunday, pay their tithes, be, be sweet to others, be smiling all the time, happy, happy, happy. But in reality, we find these commands don't have any of that. They're absent. So what does that tell us? That the church is teaching a system that is more human than it is godly. And that's the problem. That's why Christianity is lacking that ma maximum effectiveness. Okay? When we have struggles, our effectiveness goes down. When we're not directional in our scriptures, when we don't actually know when we're doing something, what is the right thing to do? How do we handle this? Okay? And you can only get that by knowing Bible doctrine as you spiritually mature from learning it in the class where the Holy Spirit is teaching His Word. Okay? Okay, so the love here is talking about, we'll just kind of jump into that piece of it. We're talking about manner of life. Um, and as we know, this is the application side, okay? Uh, this, is the, this is the doctrine that is strictly application. This is what we should be doing right now, every moment of our lives, okay? I'll tell you what, you can go to sleep. You don't have to do it while you're sleeping. Um, although... No, I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> so the, the reality of the love here is the, is the RMA side. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's a supernatural love. That's what God requires of you. That's why God equipped you with the filling of the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. You were filled with the Spirit initially until you sinned and did something stupid. And then you lost that filling because you put sin between you and God, which is what the issue of sin is, is that losing that fellowship of the God walking side by side with you, Christ himself, and the Holy Spirit. It gives us the example. Like I said, this is not a human love. So stop with the human love stuff. Okay? 
When you try to do it, it is negated. It means it, it, it is ineffective immediately. When you allow it to flow through you because you're filled with the Holy Spirit, and you're, and you're obeying the command. And remember how God taught you, Bible doctrine in the class, you get to apply it His way, not your best thinking, not what the pastor tells you to, unless it's Bible doctrine, not what your best friend, not what your mommy taught you, not what your daddy taught you on Father's Day. <laughs> okay? In reality, it is the stuff that you learn from the Holy Spirit and the truth that His Word justifies before us, gives to us right here. The pattern for us is Jesus Christ. That's a high standard, the highest, the author and perfecter of our faith. The word paradidomy, like I said, is, is, is not to really give himself, it's actually to deliver himself up, which means that he walked and said, you, you remember how um, it, with Abraham and Isaac, Remember that part reading about that in Genesis where, where, where Isaac comes up and he gets on the table and he lays down, right? His dad's 100, 100 years old. He's over 100. He's 120. About 120. 120, okay? And so this young buck, 20-year-old, Isaac gets up to the thing. You think, you think Abraham's going to stop him from doing something? You think he's... No, he's not. He delivered himself up. Same picture. Okay, that's why it refers to it. He delivered himself up. He got up on the table himself. He laid down. He didn't resist one tiny bit. He didn't sit to say, stop. No, you're not going to put a knife in me. No, I don't think I agree with this, Dad. No, this is the same thing. And the word here is really, there's a word here that says, for us. It's a suwood hu pair. And it means, uh, it means on behalf of us. It means, it's, it means substitutionary, okay? So this is telling us, and we know this from doctrine of, of salvation, is that Jesus Christ delivered himself up on our behalf because he, he pays for our sins, right? Our personal sins are what he pays for. That's what's put on him, okay? Um, and the word here for fragrant offering is the Levitical offerings. It's that word, uh, prosphora, is means a Levitical offering, okay, in which there's five different types. The word uh, here for fragrant offering, uh, the fragrant smell <coughs> that's here, is actually two different words. It means a, a, a fragrant odor that smells good, okay? And this right here, um, you hear this all the time, okay? But many of you don't put the, put the piece to it. The offering is fragrant because... It is a propitiator, propitiatory, propitiatory offering to the Father. It means that it, to Him, even though the, the Lamb of God is being sacrificed for the world, the sins are on Him. The, the fragrant part of this, which this is referring to, this is referring to His death on the cross, has a fragrant smell because it pleases God the Father that it is done. The pleasing part is to help us to understand that Christ did everything. This is why you don't have to add anything. This is why salvation doesn't require anything more. This is why this is the God standard, is that everything Christ did on the cross was 100% acceptable to the Father, 100%. There was not one piece that wasn't. That's what the fragrant offer means. It's, it's pro propitiated, which means to be completely accepted and satisfying every need that God the Father had towards the sins that we have, we, we will do. Both the past sins before the cross, the sins at the cross, and the sins in the future all the way through the millennium. Okay, before we ever, ever did them. Now, you, you, if you haven't thought about this, this is, this is a, a, an infinite propitiation, which means that you can't bring anything to God to complete the salvation by faith in Christ. It means you don't have to do anything. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to, you don't have to confess. Well, how do we know that? It's a sweet smelling. It is 100% propitiatory satisfies every need. When you add something to it, you essentially have spit on what Christ did 
I would even use a more strong word to show how foul that is. But Isaiah 64, 6 tells us that. So you gotta stop doing that. This is the meaning of the mercy seat in Romans uh, 3.25, which is up here. It's a great verse. Um, Hilastrion is the word that it uses. It's used throughout the scriptures, the Greek word, and it means to propitiate. It means to satisfy. The part of the requirement is that satisfaction had to take place. When Jesus goes up to and makes the offering of the cross to the Father, okay, this is, the, this is on Easter morning, when he makes that offering, it has to be accepted or the world is condemned. And he makes that, which is what allows him to sit at the right hand of the Father 40 days later. He has accepted that offering as 100% complete. So if you think that you want to add something to your salvation, you are standing in the way of God's written word telling you that what he did was complete. Complete, finished, done. It's a sealed deal. You made faith in Christ. It is done. There is no more ever, ever, infinitely required for that salvation, for all the benefits of that salvation. And the word here, sacrifice to God, is the withusia, and it means to sacrifice. It means, it, the literal word means to kill a sacrificial victim. That's what that word means. And it's talking about Jesus Christ at this, <clears throat> at, in this context. And it says, to God, and we know that to God actually is, means uh, to the Father, because whenever God has written it by itself in the New Testament, it always refers to the Father, unless the context changes that, which this one does not in a tiny, tiny bit. And this means for the performance of the Father, propitiatory, the propitiation that makes both the justice of the God that allows the righteousness of God uh, standard to be satisfied, therefore the justice must bless it, and that's called salvation. And that also allows something else to happen. It has, it has to do with that. His love can now flow. This helps us understand one of the most critical things about Christianity and about salvation is that, you know something? We know from Scripture that the Father loved His Son, Jesus Christ, infinitely. There was never a time when they were not loved by each other. That's the infinite love. God is love. Okay? He is it. He's not, he doesn't possess it. He is it. Okay? But note that it is God himself, the Father, who put Jesus on the cross because his love could not save us. The love that everybody talks about with God could not save us. Couldn't even touch us. Because the justice stood between, our sin stood between him and us. So note that he didn't sit there and say, Son, don't do that. I love you too much. We're just going to set this aside. And I can love them into salvation. No. He crucified his son. Justice had to be satisfied. It came before love. It did something that love couldn't do. Love couldn't even flow. Love had... Uh, infinite measure, but it was blocked. It was blocked because man didn't meet the righteous standard that God had. And God can't change that standard. So, because we didn't meet it, the cross had to satisfy it. Justice is now satisfied. Love now flows infinitely. Is that important? That's where all your blessings come from. All the blessings in time and the blessings that you will determine and that you will have personally, and every Christian forever into infinity will flow from that. That's where it comes from. It cannot flow until justice is done. So it tells us that justice itself is the part that secures that love for us. And this is talking about that. This ugly thing that we think about the animals being sacrificed and burned and chopped up and all that, it's right there. Okay. Okay. So let's get into some fun, more fun stuff. Verse Romans 5, 5. And I have for this one here, the sole source of Christian love comes from the Holy Spirit in us. It is never, ever personal. 
And if you decide that you're going to be personally be a loving factor, and you're going to give your love, it's going to be burned at the judgment seat of Christ. It's going to be burned as rubbish because compared to God's, it is filthy rags. It offers nothing. It actually brings things down. It's a negative. So he says here, and, and hope does not put us to shame. And hope is the word, you remember this word, this is ellipsis. This was the word confidence. See, our confidence does not put us to shame. Why doesn't it put us to shame? Our confidence is on the integrity of God. Where do we see the integrity of God most perfectly done? The cross. If God sacrificed his son for us, his integrity is unsalable. He, he, he couldn't, with his infinite love, he couldn't fix it without sacrificing his son. And he made the decision, as did Jesus Christ, when it says he delivered himself up. See, he knew it too. He couldn't love it either. He had to sacrifice. He had to put the sins of the world on him for those three hours. Our confidence is in the integrity of God. And it never, ever disappoints. Ever. It can't. How do you know it can't? The same way you know that love couldn't over, overcome justice and require the cross. God didn't flinch at that. That cost him. It didn't cost us. We got it by faith, in faith alone, in Christ alone. We get all that measure, infinite measure, by our faith. This cost him. And he had the integrity of character, which is what this is talking about. This is why it requires us to be Christ-like and to love like him, is because it is God's integrity. It is the integrity of Jesus Christ, the man, that we are to match. It is that integrity. Then it goes on to say, after the part shame, um, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts. This bracket here, that's the mentality of our soul, the quintessence of who we really are, the part that's not the body. And it says, through the Holy Spirit. That's the source of it. Remember I was telling you, here, up here, this is talking about walking in the filling of the Holy Spirit. What does it say here? Through the Holy Spirit. The word before it, hearts, is not heart, it's soul. Through the mentality of our soul, to who we are, the heart. That's our soul. Through the Holy Spirit, as the source of it, okay? Through the source of the Holy Spirit. Who, Holy Spirit, has been given to us. And that happened at the moment of salvation, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The next verse is 1 John uh, 2, 5 through 6. And this is my verse, for, my saying for this one is that Jesus nailed this. Uh, if you love me, obey my commands. Comes from John 14, 15. Um, so he says, but if anyone obeys his word, the love of God truly is made complete. That means perfected. That's teleos. Okay? That's, that's what happens with, with maturity. Spiritual maturity becomes complete. It becomes mature. It becomes perfected. That's why it's important. So if you look at this verse, it wraps up what I was saying over here. Okay? It wraps it up. It says, truly made complete in them. Who? The Christians who do that. If they obey his word, the love of God is truly made mature, complete, and perfect in them. See, that's why spiritual maturity is so important, because it makes it effective. It makes it efficient. It makes it exactly what it's supposed to do. And that's what they call perfected. That's shown in this verse. To them, those who do that. Those who do not, it's like Jesus said, if you love me, obey me. But if you don't obey me, don't tell me you love me. That's the criteria. That was Jesus' criteria. And then it goes on to say, this is how we know that we are in him. Now this in him is not positional truth. We hear that a lot with the in him part. This is talking about fellowship. 
When we walk with Jesus, as Jesus walked, that's this piece right here. This is telling us that this is how we are in him. And he says here in verse 6, he says, Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Now, that's not actually what it says. The word for live here is not zoe, like the word to live. This word here is, guess what? That word. Peri pateo. So let's revise it, how we hear it, how it really should be there. It says, whoever claims to walk in him, in fellowship, must walk as Jesus walked. That's what that says. That's this verse. Peripateo is used twice there. This is clearly not talking about a positional truth. This is talking about application truth. If we have fellowship when we walk with God, when we walk with Christ, and then reality, we walk as he walked. That's what this is trying to tell us. Philippians 4.18 this is a part that helps us glue one piece to the other. Part that we can see and understand. Okay? The Philippian support for Paul in offerings was their sacrifice to God. See, as walking is to us. Okay? It says, I have received, this is Paul talking in Philippians. We covered this, if you remember it. Uh, this is just kind of a refresher. I know I had to look back through it and look at the original words that I wrote in here so I could get the fullness of expression here. He says, I have received full payment. This is talking about the offering, okay? He's trying, if you remember this, this is when Paul's trying to tell him, you don't need to send me any more money. I have everything I need. Thank you very much for your offering, okay? This is what he did. I have full payment and more than enough, okay? Remember, he's in prison when he writes this to the Philippians, he says, I am amply supply, supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus. He's the teacher, pastor teacher at Philippi. The gifts you sent. They sent him money. If you remember this piece, this, this is the part where it tells us, you know, the Philippians were not, did not have much money. And they were being persecuted during this time. But during their entire persecution, and they went through bad persecution, they were giving everything they could to support Paul because they believed in his ministry from the first time he was there. They believed in him. They believed in his ministry. They knew Christ from him and they spent their entire lives. Remember that even this piece here documents a piece of about, about 15 years of continuously giving. He uses this as an example. Remember he says, he says, he says when he's encouraging the, the Romans to provide money for to help support um, uh, Jerusalem when they're in starvation. He says, give as the Macedonians gave. Philippi is the Macedonian church. That's the area that it lives in. He was talking about. So he's telling them, thank you very much. You've taken care of all my needs. I don't need any more. Thank you. But this is the part I want to get to. The next piece, a lot past. He says, they are, talking about the, um, the offerings and those offering, those, the, the sacrifice here, a fragrant offering. Same word. This is, how we, this is how we live that offering. Day to day. Okay? When we walk with Christ, we are an offering to Him. Okay? We are that offering. And then it says, an acceptable sacrifice. Same word. This is the killing of the animal part. This is a helping us understand that this piece here not only the acceptable part means it meets the divine standard that God has for this offering. Just like the, just like the, the for those who are familiar with the Levitical offerings, they had to be prepared exactly so, or they were worthless. If there was even a speck, or even a wart, or even a little thing that was wrong with their, with their fur, couldn't use them. So this is telling us that this is the perfect standard that God requires to satisfy him. And how do we know that? Because it says here, pleasing to God. Okay? This here, and that's God the Father. God the Father who is who Christ offered himself for. Okay? This is that standard. Now, 12.2 we're all familiar, fell one we're all familiar with. The next piece here is say, uh, I wrote down, uh, <clears throat> we too are to present ourselves as daily offerings. See, this part right here, this example, this is a daily offering to God. 
This is what we're supposed to do in our lives. And I gave you an example of that with offering. But this is also when we give to others. This is often when we offer that water to that person in need that it talks about in prison. Okay, most of us don't have the opportunity, but there's many opportunities that God puts before us. And it says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy towards us, to offer your bodies, now this first bodies is the same word as your life. It's, it's a metaphor for that. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Okay, and that liver size, living sacrifice is this one. This is the whole sentence. Walk in the way that Jesus loved and, and offer himself up as a sacrifice. This is it. This is that piece. This is the part that we are to live our lives as. Okay? This is the same as the peripateo, to walk, okay, daily. And it says a living sacrifice. That means by your daily, moment-to-moment -moment life. And it says here, holy and pleasing to God. What does holy mean? It means set apart. It means set apart perfectly, okay, meaning God's standards. And pleasing to God, okay, this tells us the pleasing part meets God's standard completely. And then it tells us, this is your true and proper, we'll run into that verse, that word here, proper right here, as improper proper, means that this is proper for the status that we hold with our relationship to God. This is true and proper worship. This is the offerings of worship, that when we live our lives, this is really telling us, Nutshell, the same thing we're hearing over here is our daily moment-to-moment -moment life that we walk is the peripateo that is pleasing to God because it is true, meaning to the Word of God, and proper for our status as royalty of God. We are the very children of God. We are royal children. We're His sons. Okay? Now, Romans 3.25 this is the propitiation. See, this is the part that actually is applied to this piece, right there. Okay? Now, if you've watched this, you can almost assign each of those verses to a piece that expands on that verse. Okay? And these are just the ones we're covering. And Romans 3.25 says, The propitiation towards the Father for us, this is divine love. This is what it is. And it says, God presented Christ, meaning God the Father, as a sacrifice, sacrifice of atonement. This is, this is the redemption, atone, to atone for. This is actually where we find unlimited atonement, which means that God covered all the sins of the world. There's nothing holding anybody back from being saved because they were all paid for. It's just faith in Christ that requires that. This is the great evangelism piece. Through the shedding, this meaning the cross, of his blood, of Jesus Christ, to be received by faith, if received by faith is the atonement of Christ through faith in Christ. That's where it comes from. You, when you have faith in Christ, that atonement washes you. Every sin that you have ever committed, every sin that you will commit, is whoosh. You are now made righteous with God, which allows Him to bless you because you are righteous. He, you meet His standard. You meet His perfect standard, so therefore God is now free to bless you maximum. But he will not bless you to a point that you cannot handle it, which is what capacity through spiritual maturity is all about. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness. We talked about his righteousness. This is because in his forbearance, and forbearance means patience, okay, God's patience, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Now what it's talking about there is, it's talking about our personal sins. It was, a, we never had, as Christians, we have never had our personal sins count against us. They were paid for on the cross before we were ever born. Think how tough it would be. <clears throat> you're saved. You commit a personal sin. If Christ didn't pay for it, you're condemned. And there's no way to, there's no way to fix that. Right? Unless Jesus now comes on this side and pays for it. 
So your personal sins, every personal sin. This is why you just cite it. This is why you, 1 John 1 is citing, okay? What sin's biggest problem, like we've been talking about for three weeks, is that it stands between us and our fellowship. It, it stops us in our mission because we don't have the power of God to carry that mission out. That's the problem with sin. And that sin degrades. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Now the principles here, I have, I could just go on and on, some of the stuff is just fantastic stuff. Um, the law was fulfilled when a, when a believer under the law loved his neighbor as himself. Okay? That was the requirement of the law. Leviticus 19.18, Matthew 19.19 are examples of that. But Christ asked the Christian, commands of entreaty, in fact, for us to love other believers exactly as he loved us. That's the standard. Christians today don't even come close to that standard. They provide their own rubbish. In reality, they withdraw the love of God that he has prepared in them through the filling of the Holy Spirit and the desire to learn more about him so they can do it more effectively as Christ did from day one, okay? He provided us with that divine love to execute this plan right here. This is what Christ requires of us. Not so simple as being diplomatic to our neighbor, but to have God's love for one another as he loved us. And we know what that took. We can't do this part because our sacrifice would be worthless, right? We're not, we're, there's nothing pure about human beings. He provided for that because we could not. We were incapable. It was impossible. This is why unbelievers can't be saved. It's, they cannot be saved. If they don't have faith in Christ, they cannot be saved. There is no other way. No amount of goodness and niceness, no matter what it is, can reach the standard that God requires in His righteous requirements. They do not propitiate. They don't satisfy. Therefore, God has to reject them which is what happens at the white throne judgment. They provide all their stuff. God says, I've weighed it, I've weighed it out. And it is lacking, infinitely lacking. You chose to condemn yourself by your choice of rejecting Jesus Christ. That's what it's going to sound like. Number two, we Christians, divinely enabled by the Holy Spirit to fill this holy Honorable walk, as Christ walk, Christ-like in manner of life. Strangely, from the divine viewpoint, we are infinitely blessed in time and in eternity for following Christ's lead. The blessings that we have for that are infinite in time, infinite in eternity, not even capable of understanding that. The thing that keeps us from that the Christian is effectiveness, the effective Christian life that can only be done in spiritual maturity by knowing the Word of God and by being filled with the Holy Spirit. We have here says the love of God for God and the love for fellows resulting in surpassing riches. That's the word we covered last week, if you remember that. Surpassing riches. For those who obey this mandate of entreaty. You can see we're not going to get far, huh? Let's get out of the verse, right? Christ's love is a display on the cross for all to see. The who pair is the instead of us. Excuse me. It is the divine love that is allowed to be executed. Number four. It is important to remember and to remind ourselves that God does not command us to do something that we are not capable of doing. It means that this command is a real command. It just has to be done God's way. We'll just brush into this and come back to it. <clears throat> this is the um, piece here where it says, But among you there must not even be a hint of sexual imm immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because it is improper 
for God's holy people. And that improper means that it does not meet the status that you possess. Okay? Now, what this has to help us understand is that this verse here, the most common, and, and it's hard for us as Christians in the United States to get it, because even today, we are surrounded by Christian standards. But we're getting more of what they ran into. We're getting more of the LGBT stuff. We're getting uh, all this stuff, the homosexuality, lesbianism, uh, even pederasty, even this influence of evil going to our society. This was not true prior to this time we live in. So most Christians don't really grasp what was true in the early church in places like Asia where they had uh, ancient religions. Uh, we've, we've studied some of those. Um, Sibylle was one we studied, where they were required. In fact, we're familiar with some of it in the, um, in the uh, virgin sacrifices and the, um, uh, the Phallic cult that existed not only with Baal worship, which it was, um, even before that, even in the Old Testament, but very much so part of the Roman Empire in the ancient world, where sexual relations outside of marriage were required of you. They were worshiping, okay? So when you think about being brought up that your entire life is what you're looking at the biggest struggle in the Ephesian church was the Phallic cult, okay? Which means that for them, um, this is going to sound nasty, but this is what it's talking about, so we have to cover it. Um, the very first one I'm talking about, the sexual immorality is talking about um, within the marriage, which means that this is outside the marriage. It's called normal illicit sex. It means uh, adultery would be the piece here, okay? So it's really talking about that. That's just the beginning of it. And then it goes into worse stuff with the word impurity. We'll cover that next week, but I, we want to look at this very carefully because it not only presents their struggle with their specific one, because of where they were at and where they're uh, at in time, meaning the phallic cult and idol worshiper. But for us, there's actually parallels for this exact same thing that runs into other areas of, even in the Christian life, even in the church. So let's leave it there. We'll come back to it next week and explore this. I think it'll be very insightful. Dearest, gracious, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for your insight. The Holy Spirit drags us and draws us into these truths. Pray, Lord, that we'll understand them, that we'll apply them, that we will stretch and reach for spiritual maturity using the tools that you have given to us. We ask this as Jesus did it in his name. Amen.